Bauer is currently the William Rosenberg Senior Scholar at Yale University. She is on sabbatical from Claremont McKenna College, where she holds the John K. Roth Chair in History and directs the Magrublian Center for Human Rights. I am also extremely proud to say that she holds a PhD in history from our own American University. Uh, she is the author of um, many books, Nazi Empire, Building and the Holocaust in the Ukraine, um, and The Diary of Samuel Goldfard and the Holocaust in Galicia. Her 2013 book, Hitler's Furies, German Women in the Nazi Killing Fields, was a finalist for a national, the National Book Award and for a National Jewish Book Award, and has been translated into 23 languages. She joins us today to discuss her new book published just last month, The Ravine, A Family, A Photograph, A Holocaust Massacre <clears throat> Revealed. Reviewing the Ravine in the New York Times on publication date, less than a month ago, Susie Linfeld wrote that Professor Lauer hoped to recreate the murder of the Jews of Mirapil, Ukraine, and to reveal the networks of complicity that made the Holocaust possible. Here she succeeds with a vengeance. Her chapter, The Action, is devastating, and I can confirm that. I have read the book. It is a magnificent tour de force an intimate tale of murderers and their victims that raises new questions for us in studying the Holocaust. I could say so much more, but I will turn the program over to Professor Wendy Lauer, our distinguished American University alumna. Thank you so much for this program, this opportunity. It feels especially, it's heartwarming, it's gratifying to be coming back to American University, if not, you know, virtually, in, in in real in a real sense because um, I'm already seeing who's attending the session right here whether it's students or former colleagues or faculty members and I would not be here I would not be doing this work I would not have published this book had I not been able to complete my PhD under Professor Richard Brightman at American University um, and I'll tell you right now that I as a <clears throat> as I applied to graduate school to various history programs across the U.S. I put out a, about a dozen or so applications. I was making a transition in my life from working in the private sector and decided that history was my passion and I wanted to get a PhD in it. And I got into one program, American University. I would not be here if it were not for that acceptance into American University's um, doctoral program. So thank you very, very much. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen and um, get into the uh, presentation as it were. <clears throat> of um, my project, let's see, and here we go. Can I get a little thumbs up? Does everybody see um, what's on the screen? I hope so. <clears throat> Each semester when I teach the Holocaust, I ask students what comes to mind when they hear the word Holocaust. What do they recall and the kind of imagery that they recall? And inevitably they describe the kind of iconic images, photographs, um, that we're all familiar with, like the railways leading to the entrance of Birkenau and the boy from the Warsaw Ghetto with his hands raised, or some kind of Nazi imagery, goose-stepping um, uh, SS men, Lenny Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will. So this is these are uh, our students and, and the general public, they tend to uh, associate the Holocaust with these kinds of really iconic images and things that are often um, displayed in our museums and all over the internet. But when we try to understand what's behind those images and what are the stories that constitute those images and the events, let alone the photographer who took them, um, that person's biography, um, most people, you know, they, they can't answer those questions. They can't reply to that um, challenge. Um, very few books have been written about single images. Uh, one on the Warsaw uh, Ghetto uh, uh, image that I described a little boy, and then on the um, Auschwitz album, for instance, but given the proliferation of these images and their importance as historical evidence, um, there is a bit of a, of a disconnect and imbalance um, in how we are, I, I argue, in how we are um, researching these images and incorporating them into our, our research methods and the storytelling um, that we do. Now, as part of my research for this project on this singular photograph, I, um, I uh, 
surveyed the survivor testimony at the U.S. Shoah Foundation, for instance, there's some 50,000 in the database. And I uh, just wanted to point out from the beginning that the image I'm gonna share with you is very graphic and very disturbing. Um, it is a quintessential image, horrific image of the Holocaust. Um, but in my survey uh, with the survivors and their testimony that they gave, um, they very commonly would incorporate photographs in their presentation, not only family photographs to honor their loved ones, um, but also atrocity images. And I was really surprised that, that survivors were imploring um, their viewers to look at these images and to try to understand them and to say, to say to us, this is what happened to me or this is what happened to my loved ones or my community. And so in some ways, I'm kind of answering that call in trying to um, uh, reconstruct the um, history of one, of one image um, and an event that um, resulted in the loss of um, an entire community in the town of Mirapol, uh, Ukraine. And here is the image. It was taken on October 13th, 1941. Um, and we know the photographer's name uh, because uh, it, it, luckily on the back of the image, um, there, is, there, there are markings, there's a date, there's a location. And the photographer uh, himself was interrogated during the war and after the war about these images. And so it came into um, the record, the official archival record, although it was suppressed in Prague um, and kept there kind of behind the Iron Curtain until the collapse of the Soviet Union. And that's why it um, didn't kind of emerge into and become available for research or at least come available to me until um, 2009 when I was working at the archives of the USHMM. One can immediately recognize that this is of the Holocaust. We see the Nazi uniforms, the wartime era clothing of the European civilians, the old rifles, the boy with his families being shot by the Germans and local collaborators at the edge of what I thought was a ravine. In my decades researching the Holocaust, I had seen thousands of photographs and cl closely studied hundreds, and I'd looked for images that captured the killers in the act. Too many had gotten away with murder and lied about it under oath. And a single photo like this one was incontrovertible evidence. It was a smoking gun. Although the Holocaust is the most well-documented of genocides, the existence of such photos is actually uh, rare. Um, there are so few that, that show this moment. This is the, you know, the, act, the, the, the extreme. This is um, genocide in extreme, um, this depiction of, of murder, uh, what the ideologies of hate and anti-Semitism can lead to. Um, but that, uh, this kind of imagery is, is, is difficult to um, uh, uh, find. Um, and there are reasons for that. We can talk about that. Uh, there is the image, for instance, of um, a man not far from this location in Vinitsa, Ukraine, uh, who is kneeling before a pit and he's being shot at close range. Um, he's wearing a suit, a kind of crumpled suit. It's called the last Jew in Vinitsa. That was the perpetrator's, the German official's uh, mark on the back of that image, um, the last Jew in Vinitsa. Um, that image, um, by the way, uh, these images, are, as I say, they're out there and, and um, we can, I can list them about a dozen or so of, of images that show the actual murder. That image, the last June Vinitsa was recently uh, reproduced and commercialized um, by an anti-Semitic organization and put on t-shirts and, and coffee mugs and caps and everything. Um, so again, this is another reason why we need to not look away from these images but um, as scholars kind of take ownership of them and, and provide that historical information and that content and, that, uh, and, and uh, call out the um, commercialization of these images, which obviously further denigrate the victims and, and, and are uh, yet another assault uh, on us, on our memory. Um, the photograph featured in my talk came to my attention, as I said, in August, 2009, but it had been in the stacks of the security service headquarters archive in Prague since the 1950s. Um, and it took the collapse of the Soviet Union to bring it to light. And here we see mass murder, not as heaps of corpses, um, but as the victims are being killed together. And remarkably, as we look in the center of this photograph, um, we see the family unit. And none so clearly shows Ukrainian militia to the right standing alongside the Germans, um, uh, almost shoulder to shoulder, where about a million Jews were killed, more than a million Jews were killed in broad daylight. Actually, every fourth victim 
Um, every victim uh, who perished and who was murdered in the Holocaust was killed in what is the territory, the uh, borders of contemporary Ukraine of Ukraine today. Our victims are at the edge of this large pit. The woman is dying from the bullet to the head, pulling down the boy alive with her into the grave. According to Nazi procedure, bullets were not to be wasted on Jewish children. They suffocated in the blood and soil and the crushed in the weight of their kin. In the foreground, we see a pair of men's leather booties positioned as if he had just taken them off. And, and next to the shoes, we see this crumpled coat, uh, empty coat, as if it's lying on its side like the shell of a man's torso at rest. And empty bullet casings are littered here around on the ground, scattered on the ground. This is the litter of mass murder. Now, when I um, decided to delve into this image and try to understand what happened that day? What happened to the people in the image? Could I identify everyone in the image? Um, at first, I started with the perpetrators. I thought perhaps you know some of them might be still alive. Maybe there could be some actual justice um, beyond historical justice in my, in the work of the book, um, and that was part of the uh, you know um, the book is about this identification and this search and the discovery process. And the way that I went about that process was to um, uh, piece apart the image um, like, like puzzle pieces. And the chapters are kind of organized around that those pieces of the image that speak to us as far as how we conduct this research um, and the historiography, the kinds of um, uh, interpretations that are out there, what can we um, build, how can we build on those? Of course, these shoes um, uh, are, part of our memorialization of the Holocaust. And we're gonna talk about that later in the way that we see these shoes at the Birkenau Museum. They're um, enshrined behind glass at museums. They're bronzed along the Danube in, in, um, in Budapest, for instance. So this, these shoes, a kind of absence and the loss um, that is part of the Holocaust um, and the search for the missing, this, this image really spoke to me. And then of course the landscape and how we do our conduct our research by going back to these crime scenes. There's a forensic piece to this. There's an environmental piece to this that these events transform the communities where they take place um, in a real physical topographical sense. Um, is this a ravine? Uh, is this the Germans as they would um, typically kind of put nature to work and the agency of the terrain, the use of the soil um, in my colleague, um, Patrick Dubois work, he talks about these, this process of the um, mass shootings and the mass graves as a, as a machinery of destruction in a way that Raul Hilberg had introduced with the bureaucracy that led the, you know, that um, was the deportation machinery that led the Jews to their uh, mass murder sites in the um, gassing facilities. But to what extent is the, the, the earth and the soil um, utilized? Um, and then what, is, what happens 70 years later? Can we go back and actually um, detect um, that transformation? And of course, the killers, as I said, um, and the pursuit of justice. And how do we identify the killers by closely looking at their insignia um, and their uniforms and their markings? Because if you can try to find that unit, um, you can go to the Nazi documentation and try to find the list potentially of the individuals who are part of that unit. Um, and that can set you on another uh, route of uh, research. Um, and, um, I spoke to a ballistics expert kind of towards the end of the project to try to figure out um, this smoke in the center of the image, the kind of haloing effect that you can see there, that opening in the circle. You know, what does that um, indicate as far as the way that uh, this mass murder uh, was carried out? Um, and of course, the little boy and the, and, the, and the woman, presumably this is a family unit. Um, and <clears throat> what does this mean? in the history of the Holocaust, in the history of genocide, when the family is the subject of not the individual, not the homicide, but the Judeocide, and that the core unit of that uh, loss is the family unit. What in genocide studies, we talk about root and branch genocide, the, the complete biological elimination from the standpoint of the genocide heirs is that family unit. In 1941, while the uh, uh, Germans and their allies, including the Slovakians, including the photographer who's who here, our Slovakian photographer. So here we have 
a clear case of, well, of, of collaboration, German, Ukrainian militia, Slovakian photographer, right? What was the ideological thinking that um, went into this uh, uh, crusade as they saw it against Judeo-Bolshevism that resulted in this kind of um, extreme violence against a Jewish family unit. Hitler had said in 1941 to his Croatian ally, um, uh, Marshal Kvetanek, he said, there shall not be one, no Jewish family shall remain um, in Europe. This was the thinking that um, the biological destruction was genealogical. Hitler said they'd been pushed out of Europe since the expulsions um, and they always, in the 15th century, and they always come back. And if we do not um, destroy the Jewish family, um, they will return. And Himmler also articulated this in his initial kind of killing orders in the summer of 41, uh, when he famously uh, at the end of July 41 ordered his Waffen SS killers to drive the women into the Pripyat marshes, not far from here into the swamps, um, the women and children, because they're going to avenge, they'll come back and they will um, avenge the deaths of their, of their fathers and their brothers. And so uh, a good part of the book is, is also um, kind of problematizing the family unit in the history of, of genocide. Um, now I wanna talk a little bit about our photographer and his initial testimony, because this is where it all started. When the photograph came to my attention, um, we had the image, uh, we had the date, um, October 13th, 1941. We had the name of the photographer. Here he is, Lubomir Skrovina. This was taken just after the war. Um, and there is his camera. Um, uh, so I'm gonna <laughs> just move right to um, one of the big reveals as it were in the book in that we we're actually able to find the, the camera that took that image, which is just unbelievable. And that's about the material culture of this history as well. When you can obtain um, these objects from this history, whether you're finding as Father Debois and his units, his, his researchers in the field have been finding the objects of the Jewish victims, the Bibles, the wedding rings, the most precious things they brought with them um, to their, uh, whether they thought they were being deported or they knew they were going to their deaths, what did they bring with them? And those objects like this camera can tell us a lot about the history and are themselves uh, another entry point into understanding. The image, the, fo the photo uh, apparat here, the camera <clears throat> is <clears throat> part of that era in the 1920s and 30s of the introduction of the portable handheld camera. The Leica was patented, the pocket camera was uh, patented in 1925 and the Zeiss icon hit the market in 1933. By 1939, 10% of the German population owned cameras. During the war, Goebbels, uh, the Minister of Propaganda embedded 15,000 photojournalists producing 3.5 million images. So the Second World War is not only unprecedented in many ways as far as um, the genocide um, and the scale of, of this campaign globally, but it was the most photographed war um, uh, uh, until that time. And so you have all this visual evidence. And as I said in the beginning, including these atrocity images, including these images that become iconic in our understanding of the Holocaust, what do we do? Uh, how do we deal with these images in a responsible way? Now, the Germans did not want the, the image that we are looking at today is not something that Himmler and his <clears throat> colleagues wanted in circulation. So whereas um, they were promoting, the Nazis were promoting the use of the camera to document in their arrogant way, you know, to say triumphant way, we are history makers, this is gonna be the thousand year Reich um, and we want to uh, photograph it. And, and, and in the first world war uh, also, um, many of the soldiers were starting to, um, photography was also prevalent in, in postcards and so forth. And they're getting into this habit or this uh, custom of creating photo albums and putting them on their, um, in their vitrina at home and on their coffee tables. And this is how they're sharing their experiences with their family members. Um, and so this is the, the era of, of, of the camera craze. Um, and here we have a German, uh, military uh, magazine um, that ordinary soldiers would have read and in and, and preparing for the uh, their participation in the war. It's called, they're promoting um, this, it says the optical panzer, like that this, bring this, you know, throw this snapshot camera in your knapsack, document these events, and don't worry, this particular camera is really durable and really um, strong. It's, it's like a little tank, it's an optical tank. 
um, or take these photos to the Agfa kind of Kodak uh, film the version of Kodak Film Company Agfa, and it's telling us you know, soldiers looking and seeing his child, his his family photographs again the family um, and enjoying them while he's on the front, and then he's taking pictures and it says photos are a bridge between the home front and the um, battlefield. Now, um, the image itself here um, was taken in Mirapol, and I needed to go back in my journey. Once I, once I um, knew that I had the name of the photographer, the location, and the date, um, and I started to think about the kinds of Nazi documents I might be able to uncover, looking at trying to find the unit here, for instance, also going into the Soviet record of justice, perhaps I could find out who these local Ukrainian policemen were. Um, trying to find out about the family, identify who this family unit is, and if there were any survivors among them, um, and to find witnesses to what happened in this location, right? So perhaps there might be witnesses in Mirapol who, and perhaps who knew these Ukrainian policemen, right? Or who worked in the German administration. So um, in addition to working through the archives, I went back to the actual location. The first time I went back was in 2014, the summer of 2014. I was um, conducting more background research before going and also actually working on another, another project, Hitler's Fury. So I didn't have an opportunity to go back, to go to Mirapol. So here, I just wanted to show you where it is. I hope this little arrow works. So here's Kiev, just give you a geographic orientation. And here's our town of Mirapol. About 1,400 Jews were living there at the time. It was an historic site, actually. Um, if you're familiar with, here it is in summer of 2014. Um, very famous Yiddish play, the Dibuk. Um, Dibuk, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and also a movie um, in, in early 1930s, a Polish a production. Um, so you can see the movie, it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, so it's an important town in terms of Jewish culture and history and, and ethnography. Um, uh, Anski and his photographs uh, uh, that he collected um, prior to the First World War that depict in a way, you know, the shtetl life, both its, um, its beauty as far as tradition and culture, but also um, uh, the po poverty as well in these in these regions. Um, there were many tailors, um, and um, it, it, you know it's it's an interesting mix of of literature that um, gives us a sense of what was lost, the lives lost, the cultures lost, the rituals lost, um, the tastes, the smells. It's amazing, um, but also a, a clear depiction of um, the struggles of those Jewish communities. Um, that were mostly concentrated in these marketplace towns. This was a Polish, historically a Polish uh, part of Ukraine and the Polish uh, uh, aristocrat lived in the fortress at the center of town. This is the, what is left of the marketplace. The actual crime scene is on the grounds of the count, the Polish counts estate, the old fortress. And so we went back, when I went back, the Ukrainians were always pointing up to kind of the hill where the fortress was, the park along the Sluch River. Um, and that was where the, the massacre occurred. And that was kind of their orientation. And, and, and that and it was very close to this town center. This image to me is um, in some ways also revealing. I just took this with my, my iPhone. Um, that's the, the town Mirapol, the, and this is a slab here of uh, memorial to the dead of the Second World War. There's no specific mention here of, of the Holocaust or the, um, the, the Jewish civilians who were um, singled out and, and murdered. Uh, it's more general um, uh, statement on the peaceful Soviet citizens. We have an empty uh, champagne bottle there. Um, there's, you know, just a lot of, you can't see it here, but it's a, it was kind of a, you know, a very sad space in a way because you can see, you know, there's missing buildings here. I, I looked at images from the 19th century and it was a really, had been a very bustling, very kind of um, uh, um, active, prosperous town. Um, uh, the soda fountain, the local hotel, the restaurants, the seamstress, um, the cafes. This is what the Ukrainians were retelling uh, me about their childhood experiences and, um, and how they would come in each week on the market day and 
Um, and this is what's left. And I know this is also the results of a failed Soviet experiment um, and Soviet economy, but it also speaks to the loss of when, when genocide happens, when entire communities like socioeconomically are kind of ripped out of the seams of that um, uh, community here. This is, this is the emptiness that we um, encounter when we go to these sites. And it's so close, like the, the actual monument I just showed you is, is right here. And this is where the Jews were gathered that day, the Jews who are in our photograph. And, um, and then forced to march. They're actually gathered kind of in the middle of the night, made to, made to stay there overnight um, where other abuses occurred in terms of um, Ukrainian policemen um, beating them, um, taunting them, uh, chasing after and raping the Jewish women um, and putting, placing the, the Jews here in a state of uh, com complete fear and terror and exhaustion. Um, and so then they were forced to march um, uh, pardon me, um, from this, pardon me, from this part of town to the site that I showed you. Um, now, as I started to um, do the field work in town and go to the site in 2014, I got a kind of preliminary idea based on the Soviet records, kind of what happened where, um, because our Ukrainian killers were actually investigated by the KGB after the war. Um, and it's a remarkable case I'm gonna share with you in a moment, but it provided um, good information about um, the steps that occurred that day uh, and, and maps as far as where the killing sites, uh, where things actually happened. So I had that in 2014, I had a general sense of, of what happened there, but I didn't actually find the killing site in our photograph. Um, I was kind of wandering around in different locations because the park is vast um, and the, the maps that were given to me that I found in the archives were not incredibly detailed, but I couldn't actually find the site in the image. And, and a local witness took me to another site, which was a ravine by the river and which was a killing site where the specialists were killed in 1942. There were three mass murder sites in this little town, um, which is also um, uh, quite uh, revealing as well, as far as the amount of violence in one small community. Um, but as I uh, pursued that line of inquiry kind of on the ground, I also was looking at the documentation in the Prague archive. Remember the image came from the Prague archive. So I went to Ukraine and then I went to, I went to this town in Kiev, then I went to um, Prague. Um, and it requires that kind of work to be moving from archive to archive. Not everything is digitized and not everything can be found, you know, through a Google search and through a digital search. Um, and when I went back to um, the Prague archive, I found the rest of the images that our photographer took. So now I had not that one singular image, but determined that that camera that I showed you before could take seven pictures that day when our um, uh, photographer went to that killing site and grabbed his camera and took those photos. He took at least seven pictures, but we found five in the archives. And as I looked at those five, ar five photos, I realized that he was, he was testifying in a sequential way as to what happened. He had seen um, a massacre before. He knew what was going to happen, you know, how things were going to play out. And so when he took his camera, he was very deliberate about trying to show us in a visual testimony this is how this happened. First, they were gathered here, then they were marched here, and then they were brought to the site. And this is when I found these additional photographs. Here we have a, a, a one woman um, being murdered. So this is among the five of the seven, but got a much better angle here on the German uniform. And this was really important. Um, and also we see clearly that this, if you, well, I did, I, you can zoom in on this, that this is an armband and then this is a Jewish star. I mean, the other picture, one could have argued, you know, that, that this was not the Holocaust because we don't know who the, you know, that they're Jewish victims. But when we got the other photographs, this, this was very clear, the armband with the Jewish star. And then this became clearer. And then in fact, this was not, um, this is not an SS uniform. This is not a regular Wehrmacht uniform. This buckle, this insignia, the cuffs, um, as I would find out later on, was a customs guard. These were, the photographer called them finance officers. And I thought, what is that? They're part of the finance ministry. And so this 
um, collaboration, this horrific uh, uh, event here of collaboration. These, these individuals can't speak the same language. These are two Ukrainians in Red Army repurposed coats. They've got their armbands on here. Um, they're sharing in, these, in this horrific act. Look, there are more, more witnesses here, right? Um, so uh, they're not cropped out or they're more visible. So the possibility of collecting more um, testimony from these local witnesses. Um, but these are all volunteer. These, these Ukrainians volunteered to be in the police and shoot Jews. These Germans were not, they were not part of the SS and police. Um, they just uh, 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 were um, recruited on the spot from a, a larger unit there. Their, their typical day was going into the post or post office or going to the railway station and checking packages like people you see when you come out of the airport they're um, kind of customs guards but they um, these were the more um, uh, within that unit were notoriously anti-semitic individuals and so they volunteered and I eventually was able to identify these two uh, Eric Kuska and, and, and Voigt was the other one um, in a, a German case after the war. And here are the Ukrainian um, uh, killers. Um, and if you look closely, these are their mug shots from 1986. This, is, this guy's name is Lesko. And here are his fingerprints. And this is the Soviet file, the um, uh, post-war investigation that remarkably started pretty late in 1985. Um, and the, the uh, Ukrainians, um, the three of them were identified um, and convicted. Uh, two of them were killed in January 1987, um, so close to the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, one of them was a minor uh, during the war. He was 17 years old. And so he was given a sentence of 15 years in prison. And Ukraine uh, was, gained its independence in August 1991. Uh, I could not find him, um, no trace of him in the Soviet archives. His, he was sent into the prison system in inner Russia. And um, I just don't know what happened to him, but two of the Ukrainians uh, were found and killed. In the Soviet record, I mentioned the maps um, and I wanted to share this with you as well because it's a pretty impressive um, investigation overall in contrast to the, the German, the West German investigation of those customs guards was uh, started in 1969. Um, and, and went nowhere. There were, uh, it was a very slim file, really good um, interrogations and testimonies in there um, that became valuable. There were valuable details, but it was not um, uh, a, a case that went to trial. Now the photograph was not, you know, the Germans didn't have that photograph. It was sitting in the Prague archive. So perhaps if they had that photograph, it had, you know, if it weren't locked up in that archive, um, it might've changed the outcome of that West German case. Um, given how clearly we see the Germans participating in the German interrogations, when I compare the photograph that I have in my hand that the West Germans didn't have, and the Germans responding to their interrogators, and the Germans are saying, we weren't killing anybody, the Ukrainians were doing all the shooting, we were just watching, um, they were horrible. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the lies and the perjury and obfuscation is really clear when you compare the written account with the, the photo that, that you know, we had, I had the privilege of, of uh, having my hand to compare. And the Soviets didn't have that photograph either. And yet the Soviet case, um, since they went down to the ground in Mirapol, they made these um, suspects, the policemen reenact what happened basically to go through into the forest and point out this happened here. Um, they, justice was achieved there. They didn't, the, the, the testimony in the Soviet case actually matched the photograph, um, which was really uh, um, uh, quite interesting and in some ways um, satisfying as well. So here was the center of town. This is where I took that picture that showed that champagne bottle. And then this is where they were forced to march. You may, made me remember that image of the man on his bicycle. He was going up this hill. They were forced to come down past the church over the smaller river. And here it says Mirpolsky Park down here. And then into this this area here, and this is these these are the the shooting sites here that are marked off, um, and then you have the forest here. What about the victims in the center of the photograph? And um, 
How do we identify the victims? What tools do we have available to us? Well, of course, um, typically on, on Days of Remembrance, Yom HaShoah, uh, we call out the names of the victims. We refer to the six million, uh, or we name individuals um, who died. Um, but again, the family was the most intimate social unit that held communities together, was not the murder of an entire family, another dimension of the horror uh, and loss and intent that defines genocide. So how do we go about identifying that family unit? This is a list of about 960 names compiled by the Soviet Extraordinary Commission after the war, handwritten. You can see uh, a fraction of the Jews who actually perished there. Um, Actually, they came up, they knew that 900, about, about 1,000 died, but they were only able to, to um, identify by name half that number. So it was a bit of a, more than a challenge um, to, to, you know, or be kind of a, uh, um, kind of crazy in a way to think that I could identify that family when I knew that over 1,000 died, um, that I only had a list of 450, that it was incomplete, um, but you just work with what you have and, and try. And what could we do with this list? Well, um, we saw the little boy in the image, right? It's hard to tell how old the woman was, the way she's dressed and, and we can't see her face. And, um, but we could ask her, we could determine that that was a little boy, maybe three, four years old, maybe born between 35, set photos from 1941, born between maybe 35 and 39. And so I just started to look for the family units. These are the family names here. Um, and then they're listed in their birth dates and just tried to um, um, drill down and find that unit in that way. And then the Yad Vashem, this is a Yad Vashem page of testimony. Go, go to Israel, look through those um, uh, lists and those documents of these are individuals. This is um, survivors who go to Yad Vashem and uh, report that they had loved ones who died in the Holocaust and report where they believe that they died and put their names on record, describe maybe their occupation, um, any information. Uh, about uh, so more than a million close to 1.2, 1.4 million. The estimates are rough um, as far as what happened in Ukraine. Um, but Yad Vashem uh, believes that about half the victims who died in Ukraine, and especially the children, um, have yet to be identified. So these are what I call the missing. Missing. If the genocide errors uh, annihilate an entire community, take out an entire family unit, uh, what does that leave us with? How can we find these individuals if there's no one left to submit a document like this, right? And this was, this has been going on, you know, from the very beginning since, uh, you know, uh, survivors during the war. I mean, the last chapter epilogue in my book, I quote a poem from Suits Caver in which he's seeing the shoes come back from the uh, 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 massacres in Vilna and Lithuania. And people are trying to identify through the shoes. Again, at that time, who, who's these? These were my mother's shoes. These were whose are these? And what happened to this person? And this Jan Lambert's new work now, and the immediate post-war period of the search, the search, Meyer Levin's book, the search. So it's um, also part of the story of how you find these kind of the missing, uh, missing. And I was just so astounded when I found this um, document among the um, uh, those who testified of, of, about the the murder in Mirapol, the Vassel Yuk family. Um, and the fact that they included, um, the, the person who uh, submitted this um, document was a survivor who lives in Michigan, Svetlana Budnitskaya, who was, these are her cousins, this is her aunt, this is her father's sister. And they left in 41 with the Red Army. They were able to get out and evacuate and were a camp in inner Russia, had a horrible experience in the war, but they survived and they came back um, and they and someone gave them this photo. This photo was taken in 1941. Extremely rare. Less than one percent of the pages of testimonies actually have photographs from the wartime period. This is a family photograph. Another family. This is what's left of a family in Mirapol in the summer of 41. There are no men. It's women and children. This is what they wanted us to see. Not the not the photo that I showed you that was taken by our photographer but this, and this, there's a striking resemblance. This looks like the little boy. And this could be the woman who was bending over in the polka dotted dress. And in fact, she's bending over and there's a child on her lap. And we'll look at that later, um, which I, I was zooming in and out and using digital 
technology and so forth determined there was another victim, another soul on her lap. Um, and interviewed, I went and interviewed um, Svetlana. I was just um, so excited. And, but she could not identify with certainty that I showed her the image, that, the atrocity image, and she just looked away. She could not, she was a child herself. Um, she was born in 1936, so she could not um, determine, identify with certainty. And that's, that's the ambivalence. That's, that chapter is, is that um, sense of, of not knowing with certainty, and also understanding that you know that's a challenge. It's a challenge as a researcher um, to uh, to to make that identification, and it's working against what the genocide heirs wanted, which is that complete erasure and that um, absence. And this is the uh, this beautiful image now of that family. And even if it, I I ultimately also uh, realized, even if I didn't make that actual match, that this was another family that I could you know whose stories. Um, were uh, I could uncover and, and, and tell. A lot of the book is about, as well, about witnessing them in the local community and going back to that community. Here, this woman is looking at the photograph I just showed you, and she's talking about, oh, I recognize her. She was in the marketplace. And, just, um, and then they started to, as they saw this image of this family, the Ukrainians started to tell the stories about their classmates and um, their mother, who was the maid working in this household, and and they started to ident they started to give me more names of Jewish families that weren't on the Soviet list, and so that um, leads to more research. And here he witnessed the actual mass murder that day in our photograph, and he's describing what he saw. This this young this old, he was a peasant boy <clears throat> working in the fields, and um, and this woman as well. Um, uh, witnessed what happened in the marketplace from her window when was talking about that. It turns out that Skrovina, I don't know how much time I have left. Um, uh, maybe um, I'm probably going over my time and someone can, can interrupt, but I, I wanted to also point out that the photographer, um, uh, let me look at the chat, make sure I have enough time. Hmm. Um, he turns out it's this part of the book was so uh, such a surprise and really brought me joy and that's hard to admit in a, a book about such a grim photograph, but he turned out to be a rescuer I mean he this photograph was his enough moment his point of of no more, of um, I'm going back home. This is not the war I signed up for. Uh, he was apolitical. This was not his character. I, I interviewed his children um, and looked at the, obtained the correspondence between him and his wife from the war, which is describing what's happening in Mirapol and it's making him crazy. And he's talking about his haunting dreams and that his hair is turning gray and there's blackness seeping into his brain. And um, and he's, he's, he's a young man, he, um, the age of my students when I teach in, in college. And um, you know, what, what would you do if you were confronted, placed in this situation? He's documented with a camera. That's what he knows how to do. He's an avid photographer. He goes back home. Um, he shows these images to the Jews in his hometown of Banska Bistritsa. He hides a Jewish family in his attic, including a man who's a OBGYN who actually delivers his son, Lubomir Jr., who I interviewed. He was born in 1943. So it's also a story about resistance and that this image um, is a warning to us as far as the, the extreme of genocide, but it's also a story of resistance. And this is his um, testimony, if we have time. Um, I could uh, read parts of it because it's also very interesting, the details that he um, describes um, in the image there and the other images that we found. And lastly, um, in our search for the missing, we, was, we went back to the site um, and here is the path into the forest. And here I am with Yahad Unum's team, the photographer and interpreter and a researcher a colleague, Andre Umansky. And we found the um, location. Uh, and once we got there, it was in a way uh, believable, recognizable because the terrain was so uh, unusually messed up. Um, and I had read in, in the work of uh, um, Sturdy Coles and other in forensics and people who work on aerial photography and identify mass grave sites how the landscape changes and the haloing effect and the disruption of the vegetation um, 
And so as we stood there and saw all these mounds and demarcations and um, just the, the, the strangeness of it. Um, and then we started to, to kick around into the soil and just, just walk the grounds and try to take it in. And we uh, uncovered actual bones, uh, human remains um, from that massacre that is a vertebrae. We found skull fragments and just shocked that it was so close to the surface. And it was so close to the surface because during the Soviet investigation, they went in there with um, tractors and bulldozers. They wanted to get the bones for the trial for that and also to erect a memorial in town. Um, and so they really disrupted the landscape even more and that brought the bones um, to the surface. There you can see the equipment that they used. So in conclusion, um, I just want to wrap up uh, briefly with a, a little bit from the book um, and back to the shoes so we can exhale a little bit um, from, the, from the stories and from that um, uh, disturbing image. The empty shoes and the crumpled coat exist there as questions, as gaps in knowledge. They remind us of the victims whom we cannot see, the many who were murdered, and remain missing. Like flawed testimonies and memories, photographs can mislead because they can never completely capture the reality of the event pictured or those involved. The Jewish man who was murdered, perhaps with his family, is not there, although his empty shoes and crumpled coat remain. We cannot see beyond the frame of the image. We cannot turn 360 degrees to take in the entire setting of the victims waiting to be killed. Other possible onlookers, including our Slovakian photographer and his comrades, and more German officials. The papers strewn amid the bullet casings at the edge of the mass grave could be German lists or Jewish identity documents. Atrocity images, especially the rare ones that attest to acts of genocide, the crime of all crimes, offend and shame us. When we turn away from them, we promote ignorance. When we display them in museums without captions and download them from the internet with no historical context, we denigrate the victims. And when we stop researching them, we cease to care about historical justice, the threat of genocide, and the murdered missing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was simply extraordinary. And especially having read the book to see all of the images, um, to get a, a, a deeper sense of, of what I only saw in words in the book. I mean, you certainly have um, many images in the book, but um, I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by quickly asking a question. And then if we have more questions, please um, post your questions in the Q&A. And I do see that we have a few that have come in already. Um, in, in the book, you made what I, uh, I mean, there were so many places that I kept like, saying, oh, I, I need to write this down. The quotations were incredible. But you wrote about potential of discovery if we look closer. And it took you more than a decade to write this book, right? You were, I mean, you wrote, you published Hitler's Furies in the middle of it, but you were, you, you saw this photo for the first time. And what struck me when you wrote the book is how, and you did it in the talk also, you talked about your research project. You, you you told us when you you know what you were finding what you were looking at and i was wondering about the decision to do that because it, it makes the book both a book about the holocaust but is also a book about being an historian could you talk about that decision yeah um i just realized over the years so you know a bit about my career and i kind of grew up with a museum in dc it was part of my graduate training right kind of extracurricular and I, so I was in the kind of public history realm and I could see all these different ways, including the material culture and the use of photography and imagery um, that was brought to bear. That was kind of how we represented the Holocaust and, and, and brought those stories to a larger audience, um, number one. And then also in the scholarly realm, um, just fascinated by the growth of research methods and interdisciplinary methods and teams working together. Now I'd, and, and, and so I thought, you know, um, if Holocaust his historians or scholars, I should say, because it was you know, dominated by historians, but opening up into all these realms of literature and forensics and, um, and uh, cultural representations and memory, um, it, this enormous rich field of, of scholarship, um, wasn't, wouldn't that be important to share 
um, with, with graduate students and students um, who are where, where research is so fundamental um, in how we um, work in our lives and understand, you know, in the growth of knowledge. Like I, as a graduate student at AU, um, took some amazing seminars that focused on the French Revolution, for instance, at that moment in the 90s. Um, the stories of the French Revolution were really taking off in different methods and approaches and um, and other and, and subsequently I know graduate students who've been trained um, on um, ar archives and archaeology of knowledge and you know and, and racism in the archives and discrimination archives. like all the ways that we are trained to do this research um, other cases say the French Revolution or the history of, uh, of slavery those were being kind of, centered as um, examples, as models of, of breakthroughs in research. And I felt like our work on the Holocaust was, people didn't quite realize that even though we're very present, um, uh, uh, you know, um, in the memorial culture and so forth, that that type of, those advances were, were not on kind of full display for students and graduate students to experience their own training. Um, so I, I also wanted, I was, maybe it was, presumptuous of me, but I kind of in my mind imagined like if I were a graduate student, this might be this might be interesting to read and it might inform my project, no matter what my project was on. And in the beginning of the book, I, I say, what would you do if you discovered a photograph like this of a lynching? And we have, you know, a wonderful book by introduced by John Lewis on photographs of lynching, for example. And, you know, wouldn't it be interesting if somebody would really delve into one photograph in this case, you know, or so to try to encourage a similar kind of um, discovery process and to be aware of all the different ways that one can reconstruct the past. But what I love about that answer is how courses that weren't directly related to your subject were informing how, um, how you were studying. So we have, we have a question from Rachel Rubin in the chat. Um, Rachel is actually in my Holocaust history class at the moment. And mm -hmm. um, Rachel, I think we're able to let you actually ask your question rather than me reading it. Hi, can you hear me? We yes, can. yes. I can. Well, first, I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Lauer, for coming to speak with us today. This was, as Dr. Uh, Nadell said, this was wonderful. So my question for you is, when you were first starting out in your research, where there any misconceptions about the history of the Holocaust that you discovered uh, and later were able to dispel? <clears throat> and simultaneously, are there any misconceptions that you see a lot of young Holocaust scholars uh, kind of run into frequently that you would like to dispel for us here? Hmm. Well, first of all, um, we don't know all there is to know. I think the fact that um, the Holocaust um, uh, is part of our uh, you know, popular consciousness or memorial culture. We have an institutional infrastructure like the museums and Yad Vashem and the Museum in Washington, DC and, and these kinds of rituals and monuments around erected at, at the camps and in, in Europe and so forth. So there is this presence of the Holocaust that like gives people the uh, assumption that, that we know all there is to know. I hear that often actually, like, why another book on the Holocaust? Like, don't we know all there is to know? Why do, you, why do we keep going back to that event? And, um, and we don't, and in fact, that question, don't we know all there is to know, I see as a kind of, is also interesting to, to think about, like, um, uh, where is that coming from, that sense that, that assumption is that we know all there is to know or enough already. Um, and so, you know, I, I see that as a challenge, like, well, maybe we don't, like, let's start with this photograph. So um, I, um, there's plenty more to find out, and in fact, we have been um, in some ways, I mean, the scholarship is enormous going back to the 50s, but if you think about it, the documentation on this event is really just starting to become declassified in a major way since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So since the last 25, 30 years during my training and during my career. So how can we say we know all there is to know when the body of evidence has really been inaccessible and is in all these different languages and so forth. Um, a lot of, um, English speakers say, we know all, don't we know all there is to know? And I'm like, well, have you been to a Croatian archive race recently <laughs> or the Vatican archive that's just opening now? Um, so uh, that kind of um, popular misconception is something that I just wanted to, to point out in terms of, you no, know, there's plenty more to learn. Um, 
but also things about the history that have um, dominated for the years, like the issue of collaboration now that is really coming out, that it's that it is a European story, that it's centered in Germany, you know, no Hitler, no Holocaust, clearly. Um, the Germans initiated this and are, you know, the primary um, uh, you know, architects of the genocide and, and implementers of it and all of that, very important. But that image shows us just how much this is European history and that we have to pull back and look at it more broadly as this mass participation in all these different forms um, and not kind of uh, focus exclusively on like Himmler and his SS agencies, for instance, how it, you know, these open up into social historical studies because they're in these communities as we were looking at the Ukrainians relating their memories and what it does to those communities. So these were some of the um, things that I was playing with. Assumption that we, we've identified all the victims, right? Assumptions about, about justice um, uh, across Europe and, and where did it succeed and where did it not? Um, so assumptions about um, finding the victims that we can, that we have all the tools to find them and the so-called missing missing. So yeah, that's uh, assumptions about the uh, existence of these types of photographs. Um, uh, the, they're in fact rare and, and why are they rare? We have an, another question from um, one of our graduate students, our PhD candidate who's following in your footsteps in our program, Andrew Sperling. Um, you can come on and ask your question directly. Hello, um, thank you for speaking today. I'm actually three chapters into the book and I find it very insightful so far. Um, and I wanted to ask, how did you approach Ukrainian locals to ask them about this massacre? Um, what were those conversations like? Were most willing to assist you? Or did you find that most were sort of reluctant to dredge up the past or maybe there was a combination of willing to assist and, and being reluctant? Okay, great. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, Rachel. Um, so glad you're in that program, and I hope we can continue our conversation. Um, and by the way, for the graduate students um, and students in general, it's a it's a small book. Uh, I know everybody's pressed for time, and they don't always have the so-called like a zitzfleisch to to get through a, a 600-page monograph. Um, a lot of the the book is footnotes, um, it, about half of it. So I tried to kind of distill it down um uh in that way and but i think you'll find more uh leads and more research possibilities um and sources and everything and i encourage you uh to really look at the footnotes and that's kind of the scholarly apparatus is back there um okay so the ukrainians um the, so i had two trips to mirapol in 2014 and 2016 uh, and I'll just jump to the 2016 trip because I went with this organization, as I mentioned, um, Father Debois and his team, the French team that's been going across Ukraine and the former Soviet Union, identifying thousands of sites um, and trying to protect those mass graves and doing the research there and their field work. And they have a whole kind of system whereby they um, go in very efficiently and do their work. Uh, with their team. And I wanted to, I've worked with them before, um, not in the field, but um, as an academic advisor. And I wanted to, ex I wanted to participate in that with them and see like, how do you go about this? And how do you work with the locals? I have um, basic reading knowledge, very basic of Russian and Ukrainian, but I was not, um, you know, I didn't have the skill to, I need an interpreter. Um, and they, you know, were very, they were, um, had that all in place as it were. So, we went back in 2016 and um, basically what happens is it's, it's kind of interesting. They, they break out into teams. I kind of, I gave them all the documentation. So they knew this kind of the story and they had all the images and stuff. So they um, descend on these, on this community. Um, they have local uh, Ukrainians, not from the town, but who um, are familiar with the town and can speak the, the language and whatnot. And they go out, there's an elderly couple and a younger couple, and they're kind of going around and circulating in town trying to determine who's left, who in town was there during the occupation, who might have witnessed something, do they have a memory, um, what is their age, are they, you know, were they old enough at the time to, to really absorb what was happening? Um, and they kind of identify those folks by circulating and talking, seeing, you know, go to the local church, go to the local gathering places. We ended up with a list of about 18 people. Um, and then, um, and they would just pick up like 
find out from them like, oh, where, where were you? And, and get little pieces of their story. Um, and then at night, they would, we, would, we would have a kind of um, session at night in the hotel and figure out you know, wh whom we should interview and start to see where their little snippets, what they witnessed, um, matched up with some of the um, documents. Uh, if there was, you know, if it was worth pursuing, and those you saw the images of some of the people that we that we interviewed, and they were very forthcoming. They, um, you know, unlike the perpetrators, first of all, they were uh, requisitioned. They were either witnessing something or forced to do something for the Germans. I didn't interview, you know, former policemen. These were just civilians who were there, and they were also um, very candid about during the the pogrom part of this massacre, as it were participating in that and taking things and seeing what was happening. Like they didn't, you know, didn't have any qualms about that. Um, so there was still some re residual kind of some anti-Semitic kinds of comments and so forth. But by and large, they really just were kind of just tell me their, their piece of what they saw. I was standing here and I saw that. Um, and it's kind of in a, a deep memory for them because often it was something traumatic that they um, witnessed. Um, and so it, it was uh, a pretty, pretty stable memory. Um, and that was it. So it would be a piece of the story. We spoke to a woman now elderly who was forced to dig that pit um, and, and, and beaten by the Germans and, and, and her mother was pushed over in the peasant hut. And, um, and so, you know, she's just collecting those pieces or showing them that photograph as I showed you an image and they said, oh, that was so-and-so. And so it's a lot of just these um, uh, fragments that then we, we, we record and record. And then it's the kind of mosaic, the kind of piecing together and seeing where those intersections are with the other material. Jack Del Nuncio, who is another one of our graduate students has a question. You'll be able to come on and ask it yourself. Hi, Dr. Lauer. Um, Hi. and I wanted to echo what's been said already. Thank, thank you so much for uh, taking some time today to share your really innovative research with us. Um, my question is, was there a sort of a distinct moment uh, when you decided that you had finished the project? Um, and I asked that because, you know, you mentioned that it was a, essentially a decade long endeavor um, and you were utilizing these global archives, sort of making pretty consistent archival discoveries, conducting oral histories, but you're also coming across silences and erasure uh, that probably made some of your questions unanswerable. So how did you sort of determine when you had the, the research you needed to, to uh, sort of, again, be quote unquote, finish the project or is it sort of an ongoing endeavor? <laughs> These projects are always ongoing. Um, you get to a point where you realize, okay, you know, I had to identify the Ukrainians, identify the Germans, determine the location, had enough witness testimony from the Ukrainians, had um, gone as far as I believed I could go as far as the, the Jewish victims and the material that was available to me. And, and of course, sometimes these, when you get these, put these projects out, you start publishing, then it, you know, it new things crop up. I mean, I've been getting emails from people who were family, you know, who, who had family in Mirapol. And can you check your list? You've got names, right? Um, which is incredible, or um, individuals saying, you know, writing from Germany, like, oh, you know, I would, I interview these vets, you know, from these units in that territory. So it kind of then generates another phase um, because it's it's a kind of weird kind of crowdsourcing, which is what goes on at the museum too with the imagery. Like, do you know anyone in this photo? It's just, so this age of uh, of internet research and communications also gives you kind of your projects get like another life, another boost. Um, and it's immediate. It's uh, uh, so that's you know, reinvigorating as well. And there, these projects are never done. I mean, I go to the archives um, here at Yale. I've been um, delighted. The, the archives is open. It's just been such a treat uh, in this COVID situation to go in there. And I have my list. You'll you'll find it too down the years. You'll have your list of of searches that mine go back to my dissertation. Like you're always still a little bit curious, like, oh, I wonder if I can find anything more about so-and-so or about my town or about this. And you're constantly kind of like doing a little check-in. Um, so these projects stay with you forever. Um, uh, so you, you better, <laughs> when you pick them, you better realize, and you know, as you're working them, that this is something I'm gonna, that's gonna be a part of me and, it's, and people are gonna identify me with this project and they'll come to me um, really for the rest of, uh, rest of my career. Um, and even at the end, when I, I realized as I was looking at the, um, I kept going back to the image and trying to find more. 
uh, clues. And um, Barry White at the museum read the manuscript and, and was just so helpful in picking out certain things, um, senior historian there. And, and we went back and forth about, or she mentioned to me about the smoke. Um, and that's what, and I thought, you know what? I know somebody um, in the um, DA's office up in um, uh, Marin County, and, um, and he knows someone who's a ballistics expert. And, and so then um, that got me going on that lead. And that was pretty late. That was last, that was, uh, last spring. That was in two, uh, 2020 when I started to rethink that, and I kind of got that into the book. So um, it's hard to let go and say time to publish, um, but I think you get to a point where you realize that you've um, accomplished certain tasks as far as identifying, reconstructing, mining certain archives. Like your list to do is pretty, pretty well covered. You, you, you've completed that. You're always going to have uh, several things, and some of them can be pretty major that are open. And that's knowledge. You, you know that it continues. It evolves. Um, it leads to the next project. It inspires, hopefully, somebody else to do more. Um, but there is a moment where you say, I'm ready to tell these stories. I have enough material and someone else, you know, can, can follow in this. Um, but, but it's, it's, you know, and writing, and I should just mention quickly, because you're astute, the writing process is, is uh, simultaneous to this. So I had been writing these chapters and sketching out these chapters and filling them out, you know, as I was doing the research. So I also got to a point where I had, you know, several hundred pages of man of like manuscript. And I also felt like as a writer that I was ready to start to really, you know, put it into shape into a book. So I can already hear from all the crowdsourcing what will be a second introduction to the paperback. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. yeah, that would be great. Um, so we, I think we have time for one more question. We have lots of really great questions, but I do want to allow Alana Holland, who is actually our first ever postdoctoral fellow in Holocaust studies, thanks to a new program that we have with the US Holocaust Memorial Museum. I'd like to have Alana ask the last question, Alana Holland. Thank you so much. Um, this was such a fascinating talk and I'm so excited to read the book. And so you mentioned at several points, Soviet investigations. And I would just love to hear, and you talked about it a bit with, when you talked about the photograph that you had and the West Germans didn't have it and the Soviets didn't have it, but you had it. And then you, you started to talk about your thoughts. And I'd love to hear you talk more about your thoughts when you compare the West German and Soviet cases, particularly because you mentioned, you know, we have these assumptions about Europe and we have these assumptions about justice. So I'd love to hear you expand more on that. And again, thank you so much. Okay, so I, I hope there's, are, is my audio okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you have a little bit of background noise there too, I'm sorry. Um, so yes, the Soviet pursuit of justice, there's great literature, by the way, since you're a student, you're probably familiar with it. Um, that's the kind of subfield of, of Holocaust studies is the trials and the work on the history of the trials and, and, and good comparative studies as well. So something like 100,000 um, Ukrainians um, in, the, in the local police forces um, serving the Germans, uh, rough estimate. And you know about that, as far as those who were who were tried uh, more than um, in Germany, you know, the two Germanys and Austria and West Germany, there were something like 6,500 convictions and um, people should know as well that when we look at those trials, um, they're not Holocaust trials per se, only about 7% of the trials in West Germany, for instance, were about like these kinds of crimes of the Holocaust that, that took place mostly in the bloodlands as Tim Snyder called them. So that there's there are very important significant differences in who's being um, pursued, what are the outcomes of those cases, what is quantitatively what's going on as far as um, the record of justice, issues like the statute of limitations, there was no statute of limitations on, on these Nazi war crimes in um, the Soviet Union, the fact that the Soviet Union reintroduce the death penalty against those um, and the politics of these trials in the Cold War context. So it's very uh, another layer of the story that is, is really complex actually. Um, uh, and that's just as, as to, those are all the factors that would determine you know, whether a trial would even take place or investigation. 
and the substance of that investigation. Um, uh, and for historians, um, what is what value there is in that material as far as research on questions of perpetration, um, of, of collaboration, the different units that are involved. Um, so that's a treasure trove of material, uh, but it's not the full story. You have to think about, you know, prosecutors are not historians. Um, it's great material, but there are got a lot of absences and silences in those materials as well. For instance, I would not have had the story of the Ukrainian woman who was digging the, the pit, you know, or the or other, you know, kind of part of the local fabric of what's going on uh, in those events. Um, a lot of uh, there's, uh, you know, you can't look at these cases as uh, as the full history. The prosecutors do a great job often of re reconstructing what happened. And um, historians sometimes just kind of pick up that story because it looks official and it looks pretty, pretty airtight. But uh, we always have to go back, you know, pull back and remember these are prosecutors trying to convict. They're not historians trying to reconstruct a story in its entirety with all its ambivalences and all of the analytical ways that we look at, like say gender or race or class. I mean, that's not an, you know, an intellectual um, uh, version as it were uh, versus you know, the courts and what they're trying to achieve. So thank you so much. I just wanna show everybody the book, um, the ravine, you can see it's not super long <laughs> and a lot of the materials in the notes. Um, this was an extraordinary um, discussion. Thank you for spending the time with us, Professor Lauer, for giving us so many insights into your new book, into your research project. And I wish you every single success and a few apologies to all those whose questions we just could not get to. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Everybody have a, a wonderful day and, uh, and I appreciate your interest in this history and your attendance today. Thank you.